The living world is made up of cells, from the largest blue whales to the smallest bacteria. We know evolution brought us a vast amount of cell types, but how have we evolved from a single cellular prokaryote to the complex eukaryotes that are all around us today? The generation of organelles and cell differentiation are processes that would take a lot of energy, ultimately requiring mitochondria, but we're left with a bit of a conundrum. Prokaryotes don't actually possess mitochondria. That's where endosymbiotic theory comes in. Endosymbiosis, or symbiogenesis, is the uptake and incorporation of an organism by another. It can be seen in many points of nature, for example, the endosymbiotic protists that live in lower termites and allow them to break down bark material. The endosymbiotic theory explains that in prokaryotes, mitochondria most likely developed from the uptake of an alpha proteobacterium by an even larger archaeon. Mitochondria are thought to have developed this way due to their many similarities with bacteria. 1. Mitochondria possess their own circular DNA genome, similar to that of bacteria. The DNA of mitochondria is completely separate to the DNA belonging to the nucleus of the cell. 2. The double membranes in both mitochondria and the bacteria are separate from the membrane of the host cell. 3. Mitochondria reproduce in a similar method to bacteria by binary fission, the pinching together of the membrane after reproduction of DNA to create two mitochondria or bacteria. Currently, there are no intermediates between prokaryote, archaean and eukaryote, such as an organism with multiple complex features but no mitochondria, displaying the importance of the mitochondria in eukaryote evolution. 1.5 billion years ago, the Earth's climate was hot, with lots of extremely active volcanoes and an atmosphere composed mostly of nitrogen, methane, ammonia, carbon dioxide and water. There was little, if any, oxygen in the atmosphere, and archaea and some bacteria evolved in these conditions and are still able to live in similar harsh conditions today. Four phyla of archaea with a very close relationship to the endosymbiotic vent have been grouped into a superphylum, the tax superphylum. One archaea of the phylum that stood out especially was Crean archaeota, isolated from sulfuric springs. <laughs> The discovery of Crinarchaeota led to the development of the eocyte hypothesis that Crinarchaeota was the archaea that engulfed the alpha proteobacterium in the endosymbiotic event. This was hypothesized due to the shape of Crinoarchaeota ribosomes being more similar to eukaryotic ribosomes than the artibacterial ribosomes or ribosomes of other archaea. In 2010, another species of archaea was discovered near a hydrothermal vent site named Locus Castle, and obviously then named Loki Archaeota, much to the love of marble nerds everywhere. Loki archaeota were important find due to their possession of actin. Actin is integral to the process of phagocytosis in eukaryotes, and its presence in archaeota suggests an early capacity for engulfing, which would then facilitate endosymbiosis. More recently, attention has shifted from Loki archaeota. More uncultured archaea have been found which are closely related to Loki archaeota. Fittingly, they've been named Thor archaeota, Odin archaeota, and Heimdall archaeota, all characters from Norse mythology. 
Even more fittingly, they have been placed into a super island of their own named Asgard, the mythical home of Thor, Loki, Odin and Heimdallr. The Asgard super phylum possesses a unique relationship with the selenocysteine cysteine coding regions. Selenocysteine cysteine is the 21st amino acid in the genetic code and is coded by the UGA codon. It is coded with the help of selenocysteine cysteine insertion sequence elements, which function by driving the recording of UGA from a stop codon to a selenocysteine cysteine codon. Bacteria and archaea possess similar sets of selenium proteins, however, the biosynthesis of these proteins are far more similar between eukaryotes and archaea than bacteria and archaea, or bacteria and eukaryotes. In the Asgard phylum, selenocysteine genes have an RNA structure very similar to the eukaryote selenocysteine insertion sequence element. The selenocysteine binding sites for Asgard strongly resemble key eukaryotic binding sites, suggesting a convincing argument for archaea to appear as an intermediate between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Another key similarity between eukaryotes and the Asgard superphylum is the possession of membrane trafficking systems. Compartmentalised membrane-bound organelles in eukaryotes are dependent on a network to exchange cell products and materials both intracellularly and intercellularly. Protein networks, known as membrane trafficking systems, are cellular machinery made up of building blocks of small proteins, allowing complex processes to occur. Unlike organelles such as plastids or mitochondria, membrane trafficking systems have no endosymbiotic origin, but are in fact autogenous. And there you have it, a brief rundown of the endosymbiotic theory, the Asgard superphylum, and what we currently know about how mitochondria develop to allow eukaryotic development.